Hello everyone, really lovely to be here and have uh, this opportunity to talk about our collaboration which has been uh, through the last five years, uh, working, uh, the School of Architecture working with Ruskin in Sheffield, all over Sheffield um, and we're going to basically have a chat about that collaboration and the projects that we've done together and what we've learnt as uh, a School of Architecture uh, with our students um, about how Ruskin's ideas and his legacy have really impacted on um, how we can think about the city, how we can think about Sheffield, but also how we can think of other places too, very much in a contemporary way. I think that's the real realisation from the collaboration that, that uh, Ruskin uh, doesn't just live 200, 150 years ago, actually his ideas are incredibly relevant now, and that's what we've been exploring in these collaborations. Um, so really thinking about his concerns and thinking about their relevance today, we've introduced those concerns to our students and we've watched what they've done with them. And his concerns back in the 19th century were very much about environmental degradation, um, the working practices of, of people in the, fa in the factories of the Industrial Revolution in Sheffield. Um, and, and how he could be an activist, I suppose, and make lives better for people in this city uh, and across the country. Um, and he was also very interested in how reconnecting people with nature and with beauty and art, he could improve people's lives and people's lives could become richer and healthier. And that's absolutely relevant still, all of, all of those concerns. So we've been working together in Castlegate and Mearsbrook and where else? City Centre. All, all, all over Sheffield in the city centre too. And um, I think just we've been surprised at how our students have been inspired mm -hmm. by working with Ruskin's legacy. And we want to show you some of those um, examples. And I think really what's really struck us in terms of working with Ruskin is this idea of Ruskin being a polymath and we've really learnt from that. Um, if, if you have managed to see the Art and Wonder exhibition, I think you'll be um, full of that inspiration from his love of beauty and the natural world and really sort of connecting with that sort of idea of beauty in nature. And if you haven't seen it, it is open uh, late this evening, so do go and see it. But um, Ruskin, first of all, was a geologist. That was his first passion. And he really started to think about not just the natural world, but the built environment through the lens of geology. He started to think about how architecture wasn't just about static objects, but it was about an evolution, an evolution of materiality, of, of substance. So architecture and buildings that weathered, that were affected by time, but also were affected by people. So he always started to think about things in process. And I think that's incredibly useful for architects to always consider the city and buildings in process and not just static artefacts. Um, and Ruskin was also a, a social philosopher and we've introduced our students to that idea of um, thinking about ethics and thinking about the values of what makes the city healthy and, and uh, a, a good place to be. Um, so, first of all, we um, always go to Venice, I suppose, and we're going to, through the, through the conversation, we're going to draw out links between Sheffield and Venice. And when we think about Ruskin, we very quickly think about Venice, and that's where he sought his inspiration. Um, he started to think about Venice, again, as a series of processes. I think this was really interesting for our students because our students very often have visited Venice when they come to us. I, I work with master's students, so they're well versed in the classic places to, to, to go for inspiration in, in terms of architecture. And the majority of them have been to Venice. But then when we start to think about how Rus Ruskin looks at Venice, he sees Venice as a series of practices, as a, as a place in time, and not just a sort of collection of artefacts which are static and I think as architects it's really important for us to uh, realise that when we're looking at a place, when we're understanding a place, it's not about standing back and looking, it's about immersing ourselves and through 
actively getting to know a place and getting to know the people in that place, you can start to understand. And that's very much what um, Ruskin did. He, he wrote about the Gothic, not as a style, really, um, but more as a sort of ethos, more almost like a state of mind. And he started to talk about the Gothic, and the Venetian Gothic in particular, very much as a, as a manifestation of practices and of processes of the way that craftspeople were engaging with their buildings um, and the materiality of their place. And so he's always thinking about a place in flux. He's always thinking about places and their intimate relationship with people. And we wanted to see, when we offered that to our students at the School of Architecture, what they'd do with that and how they would work through those ideas. And we just thought it was useful to give you a wider context of Ruskin's influence in Sheffield, which began way before I was doing Ruskin in Sheffield, way before we were collaborating on the live projects, and way before it was uh, the Ruskin collection was actually at the Millennium Gallery. So initially, when the collection um, was given to Walkley by, by Ruskin, it was given to Walkley, um, it was for the metal workers of Sheffield. It was specifically to inspire them, to draw them out of the factories, give them access to art, beauty, nature, and actually, um, so it started to shape that community then. There were women and children, working women, working children, going there regularly. So it's not surprising today that there is still an artisan community there, which I think is very much rooted in the museum being there. Same with the Mearsbrook Museum. There is an artisan community surrounding um, Mearsbrook, Healy and Gleadless still. And you know, the impact that the museum had then um, in terms of its civic role was huge. It wasn't about art for art's sake. It was the master cutlers um, of Sheffield and former master cutlers that actually brought the collection there. So again, it's this sort of connection with industry, with making a living, with art, with beauty, that really, um, you can see it woven through the city, through to the sort of city of makers today. Then when the, when the collection moved to the city centre, again, it just became a much more accessible and accessible venues, really, that more people in Sheffield could, could access. Um, as, well as, the, as well as the collection itself, um, there's actually a lot of Ruskinian thinking in the design of the, the millennial redevelopment of Sheffield. And recently this year, Richard Watts, who was the landscape architect, uh, landscape architect really behind this redevelopment in the Peace Gardens and Tudor Square with Simon Ogden, they really used Ruskinian thinking of making places that were peaceful, fruitful, beautiful, where people would be able to enjoy the, the physical public green space. Um, and there's obviously, there's nature, in there, there is kind of the design is absolutely connected with the, the metal um, heavy industry in Sheffield, and you can see this the beautiful craftsmanship in the sandstone, which was individually that was hand carved. So yes, that's you know he's woven into the city everywhere already. And in Cutler's Hall, there's the visible. Um, there's a quote which the Cutlers you know wanted in the hall um, when it first opened, which is about uh, the craftsmen in Sheffield being the finest in the world at their best. So we thought, hopefully that sort of sets the context for you. We 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 thought there was lots of um, really sort of uh, fertile ground for collaboration here. Um, in terms of working in Sheffield, working with Ruskin's idea, but bringing it right up to date and seeing how these ideas could actually start to impact on new design thinking for the city right now. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do individually before we start going through the collaboration um, and the projects in turn. So this is what I do at the School of Architecture, up in the Arts Tower, um, also out in the city. I mean, that's the main thing for, for us. We get out into the city and we do live projects. So I run these projects where our master's students work with community groups in Sheffield and elsewhere, but we do focus on Sheffield. And they do real projects that can make a real difference to community groups around the city. We've been doing it for 20 years, so we've got a, a real expertise and also sort of wealth of, of, of uh, networks and, and relationships in this city. And we're starting to make long-term impact in the communities we're working with. And we go back again and again and again and work with the same uh, communities over and over. Um, so that's my sort of mission as a, as a, stu a university uh, teacher of architecture. I want to make sure that the work that happens in the School of Architecture is 
um, externalised, is brought out into the city for the benefit of the people of Sheffield. That's my mission in terms of my role there. We also have an urban room, so we're not just in the Arts Tower, which can look a little bit forbidding in terms of people walking through the door and asking what we do and finding out whether they can work with us. We've actually set up an urban room on the moor, down on the Moorfoot precinct, it's the old post office, um, and we open our doors and invite people in to come and work with our students right in the city centre. So if you're passing, and if we're in there, do come in and say hello, and we'd love to hear any suggestions you might have in working in your communities with your um, community groups on uh, architecture projects. So that's what I do. I also am um, very proud to be a director of the Guild of St George, and this has come about through our collaboration, actually. Um, and I've got more and more involved in Ruskin's work um, because of working with Ruskin in Sheffield and the, the power, I think, the, uh, of his ideas uh, in thinking about architecture for the contemporary city. Um, the Guild of St George was uh, set up in 1871 and it's Rus Ruskin's educational charity um, to pursue ideas of, um, and promote the arts and the crafts and the rural economy. And we think that the, um, and we're exploring this further actually through collaboration, that there's a really interesting um, and sort of fertile ground between linking an urban centre like Sheffield, and Ruskin was obviously very con concerned about Sheffield as an industrialised city and the quality of the life of, of its workers in that place, with a, a rural centre, and that's Ruskin land in the wire forest in Worcestershire. And we're really interesting, interested in how the city can start to bring in the natural environment and almost how the natural environment actually can start to make links with the city and those ecologies can start to be shared. So Ruskin in Sheffield, um, my role has been to um, help people in Sheffield and the Guild um, rediscover the heritage and the legacy of Ruskin in Sheffield. So it's really been about working with Museum Sheffield as well, revitalising the role of, of the collection and reconnecting it with the city. Um, so kind of went about it in a very follow your nose kind of way and started in Walkley where um, the obviously because St George's Museum had been there from 1875 to 1890 set up a pop-up pop museum and so people were able to engage locally with the history find out about the history of St George's Museum but equally importantly to engage with arts crafts nature actually in the pop-up so I always work uh, in a way that brings it alive today um, all of our projects um, create social spaces because that kind of social connection intergenerational really open and welcoming is a really important part of people accessing the heritage and understanding how it can make lives better today and um, through that we ended up working um, with the local community um, at Mearsbrook Hall which was the second home of the of the collection from 1890 to 1953 and that was very interesting. Someone just wandered into the pop-up museum and said, mm, the council are, you know, possibly going to get rid of Mearsbrook Hall, sell it off. We formed a friends group. It used to be the Ruskin Museum. Can, can you help us? So we've worked with them over the last few years to run Heritage Open Days, Craftsmanship Days, um, and are now, we'll talk later, we've done a really substantial life project collaboration with them this year. We then became a bit more ambitious, moved to areas which didn't have um, heritage, uh, Ruskin heritage in their community. Um, and I developed a partnership with Manor Castle and Development Trust. And we did a big draw across Manor, Castles, uh, Manor Park Fields and then had an artist in residence at uh, Park Centre Community Garden. So it's very much about responding to need. If I you know, meet someone or meet a community, there is a need and I feel there is a polymath approach that actually by applying Ruskin's ideas and using the arts, crafts, nature, well-being, all of this, you know, this kind of curiosity to really see the world clearly um, through this sort of multidisciplinary lens, then um, we, we do it. So the uh, murals that you can see there are in Walkley, so that's kind of us bringing our Ruskin um, up to date in Walkley by working with groups of teenagers, encouraging them to find out about the, the themes of the collection, they could visit the collection and create their own murals of, of what mattered to them. So for Ruskin it's about empowering people as well to see the world clearly and express what matters to you. 
So we're going to start off by um, telling you about the, the first collaboration between the School of Architecture and Ruskin and Sheffield. And it, it feels like a long time ago now, actually. It but was. Um, um, five years ago, um, we focused on Castlegate. And it was a year-long collaboration. Um, as a School of Architecture, we were very much involved in Castlegate anyway. At the time we um, started to work there, um, the market was still standing, although it, I think it had been cleared and it was ready for demolition. So it was a real sense of this area um, being on the brink of a new future, but nobody really knew what that new future was. And actually, um, five years down the line, we still don't know what that new future is, you know. Um, but we knew that it was an interesting place. But we also knew that it was very much down at heel and it had been for a while. And we didn't really know how interesting it was until we actually started working there. Because on paper, you read it's the birthplace of Sheffield, that's where the castle was. But actually, when you start to delve into it, there's such richness there. I mean, the layers of social history, radical history, heritage, ecology, um, the stories that you read about this place are extraordinary. And yet when you visit it today, it just looks like a blank canvas. You know, it looks like an empty development site. And we felt that as a school of architecture who were passionate about making a difference in our home city, we should be acting in Castlegate and trying to help, basically, um, that place um, live up to its history. I think that's what, it, what the idea was, you know, not obliterate it, but actually really start to value what had gone before. Um, and we felt that, you know, talking to, to Ruth, we thought that Ruskin would, would really bring a, a way of valuing that history, actually, mm -hmm. um, and really start to bring a new lens to looking at Castlegate, where um, understanding that I think when Ruskin was working, he was always looking back to look forward. So in his time of the Industrial Revolution and real shifts in working practices and, and shifts in the sort of, you know, huge growth of cities, um, he was looking back to the medieval era and trying to understand how through that, understanding that era, he could maintain that connection with, with beauty and with nature. And I think we thought that perhaps working with Ruskin in Castlegate, it would give us an opportunity to be in, the, in that same position where we could look back and learn from the Industrial Revolution and also look back to the medieval past of the, of the site as we look forward. So we learn from the past and we, and we bring it forward into the future. Um, so it, we sort of, it was sort of open-ended, wasn't it? It was our first uh, step into seeing does Ruskin stand up today for Absolutely. students, really? And I was really conscious that, um, I mean, as I was, I was introduced to Ruskin in lectures as a degree student in, ar in architecture here. I did my degree here. And I remember him being mentioned, and I remember him being such a sort of dusty old figure that he, he, his relevance just wasn't apparent at all, you know? He was just one of the canon of the people you needed to know about. And I wondered whether our students would feel the same about him, actually. So it was a little bit of an experiment, I think, yeah. So um, we first collaborated on an event um, as part of the Castlegate project. Um, the first initiative of Ruskin in Sheffield was run to run something in this room and the room next door called Wealthy Weekend, where I just thought we may as well experiment with all of Ruskin's ideas in one place, and importantly, in a way where in one room you could listen to lectures and talks about the wealth that matters, either at grassroots level or at quite a strategic level. And in this room, um, Carolyn's students had a model, a model of Castlegate, which people could have conversations around, you know, what, what do you think, what would you like to see in Castlegate? And this was building on it having been out in the community and around Castlegate for a few weeks. And I think what happened was in this room, um, as well as the, the, the model you could also make, you could draw. There was a lot of kind of um, sort of sawn up wood that you could draw on. Um, there were exhibitions about fairness, about the wealth division in Sheffield on the 83 bus. And I think when you start to work in this multi-layered Ruskinian way, the depth and the scope of conversation that you get, which is always what's important, what happens in the room, what happens when people are, are actually talking, um, was such high quality and there was a real sense 
sense of, of excitement. And again, I just thought, will one person walk through the door? But actually, you know, three or four hundred people came over the weekend. So it was really, I think people were curious and, you know, what, how, how, Rusk, how useful is Ruskin? What does he mean? And how do you see him in this different light? So, yes, really, um, the key thing you find, it takes people out of their silos and it, and it just gives you that... Um, that opportunity to think more broadly. And I don't know if you can read the, the, the quotes. This is some samples of feedback, you know, ideas that people had. And I think it was really useful for the students to recognise there's a huge wealth of knowledge in this city about this city. Um, you know, as architecture students, I think they feel as if they need to be the experts. And actually, they need to learn that they are one of many experts. And actually, they are surrounded by experts who are local people who know these, this place far better than they do. And a lot of the feedback on Castlegate was, you've got to recognise what's there already. And you've got to learn from that and build from that. And this idea that you just sweep everything away and build from scratch again was just, um, you know, the, the, last, the last thing people wanted to, knew, to, to do because they knew about the history. Mm -hmm. They knew about the layers of history, the radical history, the social history and all this fantastic heritage. And they believed quite rightly, that um, a new future of Castlegate can come from that, just as Ruskin did, you know? And I think it's really important for, for designers, for architecture students, for architects, to not um, assume they have all the answers, but to work with people on the knowledge that's there on the ground and build it from then mm -hmm. and uh, upwards, yeah. So, then, so we started in Sheffield. We felt it was obviously important to be out on the streets of Sheffield talking to people in Castlegate. But then we very quickly took the students to, to Venice for the full Ruskin experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and the master of the Guild of St George, Clive Wilmer, was there with us as well. And he gave us a, a Ruskinian tour of Venice, which was fantastic. And um, as you can see, it was a, a bright, beautiful day. And we had a fantastic time walking around Venice, looking at it through the lens of Ruskin. And here we've got this ethos, this Gothic ethos, these fantastic words that Ruskin used to try and somehow capture this state of mind that is the Gothic. And the, the students really took to this, didn't they? I think they liked the idea of working with notions of grotesqueness and savagery and things like that. Um, and Clive encouraged them to see Venice again as, as not just a sort of group of objects that you, you, you look at and you read about in a guidebook and then you, you, know, you look at as a sort of set of um, artefacts, but, but you engage with, you look past the sort of glamour and you understand that this was a sort of um, a, 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 a city that, that came about through people squabbling and fighting and uh, partying and all these stories, all these dreams and these hopes and these mishaps all go to build a city. And it's really important for them to look. And that was the thing about Ruskin. You've got to see first before you can do anything else and to see correctly and acutely is, is, is a very powerful tool and is actually quite rare. And he said, if you see right, then you know what to do, you know? So it's that idea of seeing and understanding through observing, which was really important in Venice, yeah. <laughs> so I think they took all of this sort of understanding and we're well, beginning to understand, beginning to look at architecture perhaps in a different way back to Sheffield. And they, in a way, started to engage with Castlegate in a much more emotional, physical way. Again, rather than standing back, and documenting and observing. It was like, we're going to explore through talking to people and, and almost like performing actually on site with people. And so you might recognize one of the stairwells in Castle Market, the external staircase. And they set up a sort of memoriam, uh, a, a, what would you call it? A sort of in memoriam event um, for this building because it was closed, it was emptied, it was about to be demolished and they invited people to come and share stories about the markets on the brink of its demolition. And I think again it's just tapping into that sort of emotional connection that people have to play, have with, with their place and understanding that you, don't, you can't make decisions about places without understanding how people um, identify with these places and so there's a wonderful this 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 photograph of this lad who was hugging the column became a sort of totem for him 
You know, he, he had that on his wall as a reminder that people care about this place, you know. So that was really important for them, I think. And out of that came some, I think, remarkable work, actually. And it was very different sort of work than mm -hmm. we might expect to come out of architecture students. Yeah, I was, I was when the students gave the presentation back to me, I was absolutely taken aback. I think uh, uh, largely because all of those kind of characteristics of the nature of, of the, you know, of the nature of Gothic were in there, really bold, really beautiful, really different in, in every one. And I think it had really helped them all get under the skin of Castlegate in a way I hadn't expected. So this is Sita's work. Um, and she was fascinated by the idea of the ruin um, the idea that, you know, ruins perhaps can just fall into the earth over time, you know, rather than preserving them uh, in aspic, actually allowing them. So this was a sort of fantasy of the castle market. You might recognise the tower, um, which harks back to the medieval parapets of the, of the castle. Um, the castle market allowed to fall into ruination and become an urban park through rewilding. So this was the speculation that she had. And this wonderful embrace of nature and this embrace of time. So this project was a 50-year was a 50 year, 50 year long project. She had a timeline for this whole project. So at the end, this is 50 years hence, where it's completely overgrown with mature trees. Yeah. And then other themes of, of making, very specifically, actually, the students really engaged with this idea of Castlegate historically as a place of making. Lots of industry in Castlegate, lots of little mesters and workshops, and thinking about how making as a contemporary practice can actually be visible in the, in the modern city. So this was the lad you saw hugging the column. He, his project was all about a theatre of engineering. So arts and engineering brought together where you can go and watch these spectacular pieces being made by artists and engineers together. Um, and he called it the heart of the machine. So again, it was about emotion. It had to have a heart. And then the idea of small scale making in textiles, but also, and also sort of craftsmen or craftspeople uh, making their, their, their passion uh, come alive. And it's gone on to inspire further collaborations, not necessarily with Ruskin in Sheffield. So we've continued to work with the Friends of Sheffield Castle and our Students Through Alive project worked with, um, with various different organisations in the area to develop a master plan, which was about building with what's there, not just thinking about this as a site that's just sort of stripped bare and you build from that point on, but actually really starting to work with what's there in terms of the castle remains and the river and starting to incrementally build up development on the site. So you're constantly getting feedback from people on what comes next. And that, the, the Friends of Sheffield Castle are championing that and hoping to yeah. pursue that, uh, working with the council on that. We're continuing sort of strengthening this collaboration between Sheffield and Venice and bringing Venice into Castlegate and um, ideas of Castlegate into Venice. Um, there's, a, there's a really strong relationship between the Guild of St George and the Squala di San Rocco um, in Venice. The Squala di San Rocco is where there are over 60 Tintoretto paintings, who was Ruskin's favourite painter, the one um, he most admired. So we wanted to celebrate that connection. Um, the Squala di San Rocco were really excited about it because they just said we really like the way that regeneration is, um, that, the, that, that the School of Architecture has been working in a participatory way and in the way that Ruskin in Sheffield has so they're really learning from that. We are sort of bringing those ideas of um, the, the medieval approach um, of the, the building of the Squala de San Rocco and of the medieval castle in Sheffield. It's a, you know, Ruskin's idea of when we build, let us think we build forever. So the Squala mm -hmm. de San Rocco was mm -hmm. completed in 1560, mm -hmm. um, which is the same well, time. Well, it's when the castle was sort of at the height yeah. of its power and Mary Queen of Scots was in there as a prisoner and the mm -hmm. Earl of Shrewsbury was one of the most powerful uh, people in the country. So I think it's extraordinary. I think we'd, this is through Ruskin, understanding mm -hmm. these, these sort of strange connections, you know, try, being a bit of a polymath and sort of saying, OK, these connections are there. You never would have thought there was a connection between Castlegate 
and you know the the, the glamorous uh, destination mm -hmm. that is Venice and exactly. there it is and, yeah. and it's it's not about trying to bring Venice to Sheffield as it is it, it's about that finding beauty and making beauty on your own doorstep um, so we are working at Exchange Play Studios on the 18th of October with street mural artists and creating along the hoardings next to it a new street mural um, inspired by three of Tintoretto's paintings so Again, an experiment. And at the same time, the students are going to be working in the Victoria Keys Canal Base and mm -hmm. doing a live project there and bringing that work into the big drawer as well. So there'll be images of the canal uh -huh. um, and Victoria Keys as well. Yeah. So the first project that Ruskin Sheffield was a, a client for, um, uh, for, for a live project, was called um, Wealthy City Walks. So uh, I basically gave a brief to a group of Masters in Architecture students, to, which was inspired by Ruskin's quote, there is no wealth but life. And it was to invite them to really to look at the city through a Ruskinian lens and say that actually until you can see, how can you start to build? And it's especially relevant for those students who are new to the city um, as a way of looking at what, what kind of wealth is here. So we invited them to map out in the city centre, looking at the cultural, the social, the natural, the artistic wealth of Sheffield before. So there was no actual brief to build anything, which I think was quite challenging. Mm. But that was, that was the challenge, was to say, if you look at it through these eyes, what do you see? And also putting the architects in the position of being the learners, being the listeners, um, and actually putting together, you know, doing a lot of engagement in the city centre to hear what people valued about Sheffield in terms of its arts, nature, its architecture, um, its archaeology, its geology, the sort of social justice. So they created these walks, um, these different lines with the, the different themes that reflected Ruskin's interests. And they're very interconnected, which is absolutely what, what, how Ruskin would see a city. Um, and I think it was quite a humbling process because, mm. you know, you're being told all the time what's of value, but, mm. you know, nobody was asking their opinion mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that was a real challenge for yeah. them in that sense because um, a, 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 quite a few of these students, it was the first thing they did in Sheffield on their new course. And yet, as I said before, there's this expectation to be the architect, to be the, the knowledgeable one. And, um, and also to be looking at buildings, you know, specifically. And this was much more looking at the city and looking yes, at yeah. almost a, a lot of the time intangible things about yes. the city. The map wasn't made of, I mean, they, things happened to be in buildings, yeah. but if there was a sort of a social enterprise or a, a food project, yeah. you know, they were taking people there, not because of the building, but because of what was going on inside it. So That's I think right. that was quite different yeah. for them. So I had a report back from one of the, the students who said, my mum wants to know why this is architecture. <laughs> but I think on, on reflection, at the end of the, the project, you know, they came back and they, they understood that this is a different way of looking at a city mm -hmm. and a different way of looking at, a, at the built environment where it's absolutely interconnected and layered mm -hmm. and also you don't step into the role of expert too quickly. No. You know, um, there's, there's a huge amount of expertise out there in the city that you need to learn from yeah. first. And I think that the role of walking, of actually taking groups of people around Sheffield on their, the walks that they put together was again a humbling process because, you know, and Ruskin was a fanatical walker, slowing down, mm. looking closely at things, and then finding again for the students that they weren't really showing them what was on this walk. They were being told again by everyone they were walking around what was there and what was important. Mm. So very Ruskinian, this whole process of place making, making buildings, making places by, you know, taking on board all of these polymath aspects. Mm. Um, Ruskin's use of beauty parlour um, was um, created on the moor in 2016 and again uh, Ruskin and Sheffield was a client but this time of live works which is graduates um, from the university. Um, Ruskin and Sheffield wanted to create something in the city centre in 2016 as part of City of Makers and wanted to create a space where people could experience great craftsmanship, try it hands-on and talk about it, share their own skills. Um, and we needed, this was a real first for the, for the more management, they really wanted to do this project, it was quite, you know, ambitious, and um, we looked to Live Works um, to be the, you know, they, they'd created this fantastic structure because those students understand, you know, really good relationships and relational activity with communities, so the structure they built was, was perfect, it was very welcoming, kind of looked rough and ready but beautiful at the same time. Um, so we brought in 
we brought in a sculpture which was in the Ruskin Creativity and Craftsmanship exhibition here into earlier in the year, put it on the moor and it acted not only as a beautiful sculpture but as a place that people could come in, sit, talk and we pinned up all over it what people made. They had conversations about things they could make, really surprising, almost everyone who came in could make something and they came back day after day um, and you know there were professional artists working there who so you could try out making things and it was really successful in terms of that intergenerational people of all ages and abilities coming in and having conversations about how they live and how they make a living and these things are really these conversations are vital to listen to and understand if you are involved in in making new places it was that sense of experimentation. I mean, it was a little bit hairy sometimes, wasn't it? You know, yeah. we had an August uh, storm, I seem to remember, mm -hmm. and lashing rain and wind, um, and the whole, all the, all the you know, the, the tarpaulin was, was going. But I think it was a real sense of achievement that we created such a welcoming, mm -hmm. special place mm -hmm. in the middle of a, a shopping street. Yeah. And the idea that people can access and take part in art and craft as they're going shopping um, just it was a bit of a revelation for us, I think, as, mm -hmm. as, 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 uh, as architects sort of wondering what the future of the high street might be. Yeah. You know, yeah. we've got a high street which is in full decline, not just in Sheffield, but, you know, elsewhere as well. It's a real problem as retail suffers. And so what do we do with our empty shops? What do we do with a high street? How do we get people to still come together mm -hmm. and share mm -hmm. their city together, mm -hmm. which is so important? Um, and maybe it's through doing things like this. So yeah. they can pop into the shops, they can pop into an arts uh, workshop, you know, and it's absolutely cheap by jowl. Mm -hmm. I think that was a bit of a revelation for us. And I think it really inspired us to set up our urban room on the moor. Mm -hmm. um, this became our prototype, really, to do that uh, down in Moorfoot. And just as you got I mean, thousands of people, how many people did you There were a couple of thousand people who came in over the... Two weeks, know, two so weeks, ten days, we two there. weeks, yeah. and and just knowing that you know if you're there on the moor, people will come in. They're coming into the urban room and they're finding out what we're, what we're doing. We're having conversations about their mm -hmm. neighbourhoods and their high streets, and it's a it's a fantastic way just to to to, to open up that channel really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it did feel like a proper experiment. It was a bit risky. That it did, one. and I think that's really Ruskinian. So for me, one of the things that I I get from working with Ruskin, with Ruskin in Sheffield, is, is being bold, is permission to fail, experiment, be curious, because um, Ruskin was never worried about being wrong or heavily criticised for doing things, and, it, and it's actually very helpful. Um, so, and what you see by, you know, bringing Ruskin into this kind of context is Ruskin's motto was today, today, today. It was about doing things today. So yes, use the heritage, but make it, you know, make it useful and, and active today. Mm. So I forgot to say how the Use and Beauty Parlour got its name, but it was really about Ruskin's desire for, you know, um, to bring beauty into everyday lives and very similar to the William Morris, don't have anything in your house that isn't useful or beautiful. So yes, and it, you know, it was, um, that's what it's about. It's about everyday use and beauty. Um, so, again, Ruskin in Sheffield was um, a client of a live project of about 16 students, Masters in Architecture students, and their brief for this was to envision a peaceful, beautiful, fruitful future for Mearsbrook Hall, which had been the second home to the Ruskin collection. Um, Healy Trust um, uh, occupy that at the moment and are trying to uh, revitalize it as a, a thriving huge community hub which they are doing to an extent already but would like it to become maybe artist studios cafe gallery um, rooms to hire and so the guild of st george with healy trust and with friends of mearsbrook hall were joint clients for the students and we wanted them to work with us because we were putting on a Ruskin Museum makeover week. So we knew this was an ideal opportunity for the students to really be in residence and really engage with the local community on what they would like to see in there. So the students had really live access to these sort of makeovers of these rooms that you know, they were formerly the Ruskin Museum, but transformed quite creatively by a lot of local volunteers and local artists. So 
that the heritage was, it was absolutely relevant now, not, not just what happened there, but the fact that the role of the museum, it had a really strong civic role. Um, it, it was a huge source of pride, you know, it was sort of a, a museum worthy of being a national museum in a local park. So, you know, master cutlers and, and the sort of civics in Sheffield were very, very proud of it. Um, so I think it, all of this really, really informed um, the, the vision that the, mm. the students put together. There was again that sort of emotional response when the students understood how precious this building had been and mm -hmm. still was in the community. They, they really felt they needed to step up and, and, and you know, bear a real sense of responsibility to, towards what they could bring to the future of this building. And I think we're, we're always impressed in, in live projects how students sort of connect with these projects in a way that they don't connect with projects which are just speculative projects that they make up in the studio. Um, as soon as they're working with groups of people and they understand how those groups of people identify with these places so 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 powerfully they sort of they have to make a powerful response you know they have to um, really invest energy and passion and commitment into um, the work that they produce here and I think they got that because they were in residence they were in this building they met the people who live not lived but worked there mm -hmm. visited it um, and and they really understood through doing that what a central role it played in this community so the work that they did was, again, uh, uh, probably more art-led, perhaps, certainly yeah, more hand-drawn than they you might really expect. Had, they just gave an amazing creative response, artistic response, really, to what they saw around them. And uh, I think because they were immersed in this other week of activities. So there were some mm. beautiful illustrations and paintings and line drawings of, of, the, uh, of the hall and what it could look like. Um, and I think that that's, that's really vital because there can be as many plans as you want, mm. you know, from architects mm. or sketches or imagining what different rooms may be like. Mm. But when you suddenly draw these, these beautiful visions of, you know, projections onto the hall in the moonlight and people picnicking in the hall and really bringing that area back to life, this is what really captured when we, we kind of, you know, presented it with the, the students back to sort of local community. Mm. Nobody, it, it didn't jar on anybody. It's absolutely what everybody wanted. Mm. And I think because the students had immersed themselves so much in it and um, had 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 this artistic response it was and very it was yeah. and they're so different from your conventional architecture drawings where you very rarely see people mm -hmm. you know um people are here in their multitudes you know mm -hmm. and and they're people that you believe in you know yeah. they're not just ciphers and i think that's that was a really really successful project for those students mm -hmm. they've gone on to carry those ideals through into their well a lot of them have graduated now into their sort of future practice I, and I, yeah, and I, it just made me think this project, you, you can do these things without Ruskin, but if there is a heritage connection there, you know, hardly anybody when we went there, even the, the council staff who'd worked there for 30 years, a lot of people didn't know it had been the Ruskin Museum. And that sense of local pride, when people realise there is such a significant heritage connection, mm. Um, mm. It's, it's really powerful. And, mm. and, it, and it makes people a lot more committed to maintaining the future in a, in a kind of an equally fruitful way. Mm. Okay, so just to conclude on that, so those are the collaborations, those are the, those are the projects that we've done together so far, and there will be more, I'm sure. Um, just to sort of conclude really on, on, on where we've got with all of that and what we feel that working with Ruskin um, has brought to us in thinking about these places that we've collaborated in, uh, but also a wider sense of the city of Sheffield and, and how Ruskin's ideas are still very sort of relevant uh, to contemporary placemaking and thinking about the future of, of cities. I mean, his language may seem quite archaic and quite dense and difficult to get hold of, but actually, when you start to work with the ideas, they're incredibly accessible um, and they're incredibly useful and, and still bear incredible uh, relevance to, to uh, sort of new generations of, of designers. And I think what's really come out of, it, of this is the understanding that places can't be grasped quickly they're complex and you need to approach them with people together to understand them and I think it's about seeing carefully and it's about being in that place over time and it's about allowing the layers of a place to reveal itself so not acting too quickly not assuming you know too quickly not not sort of thinking you're the expert too quickly but actually taking time 
and being curious, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and being humble, actually, yeah. Yeah. as well, and allowing other people to help you um, as a designer um, sort of uh, learn about a place and come up with ideas together. Um, I think this idea of Ruskin as a geologist, I've always thought that's the bit of Ruskin that I don't really see the relevance of, but it, it really does help actually. It's this sort of understanding of time mm -hmm. and slow evolution mm -hmm. and things just, you know, just changing. Things will always change and they will always be fluid, you know? No, and, and I mean, you know, Ruskin was one of my favourite um, maxims of his. You know, he says, when we build, let us think that we build forever. And it sounds so simple, but actually, all of the places we revisit, all of the places that are sort of utopian in our minds, um, that were built a long time ago, mm. they are the ones that endure. The ones that were built where people were thinking they were building forever mm. are the ones that work mm. today, I think. Mm. Yeah, there's that sort of valuing of, of real investment, emotional and physical and material investment in a place. Mm. And knowing that can only happen if working practices are fair and if people can work with a sense of pride in what they're producing. And when they stop the work for the day, they can access nature and beauty and, and, and they're secure in their understanding that the city is theirs mm -hmm. and that they can actually, you know, get hold of, um, yeah, art and beauty and to enrich their lives. Um, and I think he saw the mechanisation and the degradation of working practices in the Industrial Revolution and despaired, you know, and we're dis still despairing. You know, working practices might be different now, but we're talking about zero hours economy and, and, and vulnerability of work uh, and the precarity of all of that. And he would be just as worried about that, I think, as he was worried 150 years ago. And I think his, his understanding of the, the value of work and the value of craft and the environment that needs to be surrounding that is absolutely relevant still. Um, and I think, I mean, I love this image. And this was an image that was produced by a student who wasn't in the collaborative Castlegate, but we carried on working in Castlegate and she was very much picking up on what had gone before. And the idea that you can take a break from your work, this is a publishing house, you can take a break from your work and you can go climb a tree. And that was just such a simple, lovely idea. And it was those sort of moments that I think Ruskin allows us to sort of see for ourselves. <laughs>